Okay, so in this video we're going to take a look at a concept called momentum and then what we're going to do is we're going to go on to a look at another concept called impulse and then finally we're going to finish off looking at the principle of conservation of momentum. So let's start off with momentum. What actually is it? Well, we define momentum as the product of an object's mass and velocity, product meaning we multiply them together. So that's our definition that we can get down. That's precisely what momentum is. So from the description, you can probably figure out that this is really actually an equation. So we use the symbol P for momentum and M and V for mass and velocity as usual. So momentum has the two different units, we can give it a unit of kilograms meters per second because it's mass times velocity, but it also can have the unit of newton seconds and actually fundamentally those two units are identical. Uh, mass as usual is measured in kilograms, velocity in meters per second. So just to be complete about this, what do we mean by mass? Well, we mean the quantity of matter contained inside an object. That's what we really may mean when we say mass. Velocity, the distance an object is traveling per second in a certain direction. So velocity has size, how fast it's traveling, and direction as well. So uh, mass is a scalar quantity, meaning it just has magnitude. So you have mass of five kilograms. You don't have mass of five kilograms sideways or whatever. Whereas velocity has magnitude and direction. So which of the two is momentum? Well, momentum is a vector quantity. So you need to describe momentum. You need both magnitude and direction. So just some conventions, because you won't often see uh, momentum described as blah, blah blah to the left or upwards. So we use signs to indicate the direction of momentum. So typically we use up and right as positive and down and left as negative. So for this object on the left, this object has momentum of plus eight newton seconds because we've done mass times velocity. That's where the eight comes from and it's to the right. So that's why it's plus. Whereas this one on the left would have a momentum of minus six because it's got two times three gives you six and it's to the left so it's going to be minus because we use left as minus. So that's how we give an object and an object's momentum and how we calculate it. So let's actually talk now about what momentum really means and what it's useful for and I think at this point it's useful to compare it to kinetic energy because they have a lot of similarities but there's a key difference between them. So let's say for simplicity, an object is 100 joules of kinetic energy. That means we need a force to do 100 joules of work if we want to stop that object. That's really what kinetic energy tells us. So we know work done is force times distance. So fundamentally, kinetic energy tells you the distance you will have to apply a force if you want to stop that object. Or you could think about it, the distance you have to apply it to accelerate it if you want to. Okay, so that's kinetic energy. Momentum sits in physics in a slightly different place. So let's say an object has 100 newton seconds of momentum. That means we will need an impulse, and we'll come back to what impulse means in a second, of minus 100 seconds in order to stop it, because we have to remove all of that momentum. So we can calculate an impulse used by doing force times time. So momentum tells you the time that you will have to apply a force to stop the object. So kinetic energy is distance, momentum is time. So let's dig into th this impulse uh, now. So let's define what it is. So impulse is really simple. It's the change in momentum experienced by an object. And as we just saw, we calculate impulse uh, using force and time. So impulse has the same units as momentum because it's just the change in momentum. Force is in newtons, time in seconds as usual. So that's impulse. So let's actually put uh, those things together. So we said an impulse is change in momentum and we said impulse is calculated with force times time. 
So what we can do is we can rearrange that to get an equation in terms of the force. So we can see that force is change in momentum over the time the change occurs. And this is where Newton's second law actually fits in. So you might be familiar with Newton's second law as F equals ma, but that's actually not the definition of Newton's second law. Newton's second law says resultant force is equal to the rate of change in momentum of an object, which in a lot of occasions then turns into F equals ma. Okay, so just to be specific, so this equation describes that definition where we've got the resultant force in newtons, the change in momentum in newton seconds or kilogram meters per second, and the time in seconds there. That's uh, our equation and definition. Okay, so let's actually put this to use so we can see all of this at work. So if an object experiences a force of 5 newtons for 2 seconds, determine its velocity afterwards. So we can see to start with it's going at 4 meters per second and its mass is 2 kilograms. We've got the 5 newton force for 2 seconds. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to calculate the total momentum to start with. So mass times velocity, it's 8 newton seconds and it's to the right so it's plus 8 newton seconds. Impulse is force times time. Now we can see the force is acting to the left, so that's going to give us a negative impulse. So that's going to give us minus 10 newton seconds. So we can use this because impulse is change in momentum. So we can see the momentum after is going to be minus 2 because it's 8 minus 10. If we know the momentum afterwards, we know the mass of the object is 2 kilograms, so we can calculate that the velocity afterwards would be minus 1 meters per second or 1 meters per second to the left. Those are the stages that we're going through. So this is how we use momentum and impulse to actually put them to work to do something useful. It makes a prediction about uh, what will happen following the force. Okay. So now we're going to talk about conservation of momentum. So we notice experimentally that in collisions in physics, we notice that this quantity of momentum is conserved, which means, or is another way of saying, it stays the same. And more specifically, we notice the total momentum in a system stays the same. So what I'm going to do is I'm actually going to show you that uh, at work. So the general idea is if we can calculate the total momentum before a collision, we then know what the total momentum is after a collision. That's what conservation really means. And then we can use that to solve things we might be interested in. So let's uh, go to this example. So we've got two objects traveling towards each other, but at different uh, velocities and masses. So what we can do is calculate the total momentum to start with. So the object on the left has a momentum of plus eight. The object on the right has a momentum of minus six, giving us a total momentum of two newton seconds or two newton seconds to the right. So we can now use that. So we know the total momentum after the collision must be two newton seconds. So it tells us here the objects stick together following the collision. So that's what I've modeled it as here. So if they've stuck together, their masses are going to combine because we haven't lost any matter in the collision. So we can actually solve how fast they will travel. So if we know the mass is 5 and we know the momentum is 2, we can then solve that the, the velocity will be plus 0.4 or 4, 0 0.4 meters per second to the right. So conservation of momentum allows us to make predictions about what will happen following collisions, uh, which is very useful. So speaking of collisions, there are two types of collisions we come across um, in physics. Uh, the second one is far more common than the first, but we do come across the first one. So elastic collisions are collisions in which kinetic energy is conserved. So momentum is conserved in all collisions. In elastic collisions, kinetic energy is also conserved. So kinetic energy at the start would be equal to kinetic energy at the end. 
whereas most collisions are described as inelastic. So kinetic energy is not conserved. We'll see kinetic energy is less at the end than it was at the start. And the reason being is it's turned into other forms. So maybe thermal energy, uh, maybe it's elastic potential energy because you've changed the shape of an object. Like when a car crashes, you change the shape. So we've transferred to elastic potential energy, for example. Um, so that is a brief overview of the concepts of momentum, impulse, and conservation of momentum.